I can it is let's see I want this oh, hold on you know what I'm gonna have to approve it hold on He's very unhappy with letting me share. Sorry. I have it downloaded. Do you want me to present it? Um, yeah, if you would. It's not a, it's not letting me do it, so. Yeah, but we like the plushies in the background. Thank you. I hoard them. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. All right. Can everybody see this? Yes. And can everybody hear me at yeah. least reasonably yeah. well? Okay. Fantastic. So uh, I'll just introduce myself quickly. My name is Mike Reynolds. I am an architect. I work at a, a smaller consultancy called CapTech. Um, that doesn't really matter what uh, what matters is that I've been doing this long enough to have seen it go terribly wrong. Uh, so uh, happy to talk about that. If you're interested in like my credentials, why do I deserve to be out here speaking? Uh, I do a lot of speaking. I uh, spoke at this topic at London's Calling and TDX this year. Uh, I've published on the admin blog and the architect blog will contribute to work that's on the architect blog. And I hold, uh, I think 20 Salesforce certifications. I've been doing this for about a decade and I'm a, I'm a real big fan of Salesforce in general. So that is me. Uh, if you go forward, we'll see the way that I'm gonna approach this is pretty casual. You can go to the next slide, please. Uh, we'd love for this to be a conversation. Uh, if you don't interrupt me, I'll get through the content in 10 minutes because I'm a fast talker and I speak too loudly. Um, I have a wife who tells me that very frequently. It's why I work in the basement and she gets to be upstairs. Uh, it's very straight and to the point. We're going to talk about what's changing because we're not losing our profile, right? It, it is sticking around. We're going to talk about how, how we make decisions about approaching problems like this. And then lastly, we're going to talk about the new model, um, which is just my approach. It's not the only approach. There are some other ones out there. Uh, but once we talk about how we approach it, you'll see why uh, we lead to where I got. So next slide, please. All right, what's changing? Title slides are useless. I don't know. We only put these here because if I didn't have these, it you know it would it'd be like five slides, and that's that's not cool, right? We can just skip this one. All right. So this is a slide that I stole uh, from TDX. This is uh, Cheryl Feldman's slide. Um, this is her announcement. End of life. The permission on the profile is gone or will be gone. Right. So. Uh, what does this mean for us? This really means that we get to keep our, our profile. It's not going anywhere. And it still serves a really, really important purpose. If you nerd out on the concept of the profile, you'll realize the only thing that the profile brings to the table, the only value it actually has, is that it's the only thing we only have one of, right? You can't have three profiles. You can have three permission sets. You can have three permission set groups, but you only get one profile. And so its value is that if we have to set a default or I have to do something where you can only have only one, I've got to use the profile. And for that reason, the profile is going to stick around, right? Until they come up with something new, but it would be the same thing, right? Because of this idea. So that's what the profile is good for. Anything that can be additive in nature it's going to have to live somewhere else, right? And that's really why permissions are moving. So permissions are going to move out of scope. They're going to go into permission sets or permission set groups. Um, anyone have any questions about that? Uh, when will new profiles, hold on, let me open this up. When will new profiles after uh, 
end of life be permitted? That is a great question. To my knowledge, we're not gonna be stopped from creating profiles. So you're going to be able to continue to create them and continue to use them. What is changing is going to be your ability to have a permission inside that profile. That's going away. You should be able to continue to create them if I understand your question correctly. Yeah, and I think like to add to that, that's one of my questions. In mm -hmm. this, um, in the announcement that Ms. Cheryl has posted, she doesn't list a lot of things that are on profile now. And um, I'm just wondering, are those to be determined or is it really it's only when you put them in the profile? Yeah, so what she has been clear about is, well, this is this is the way that I would approach it, because what's going to happen between now and spring 26? Probably lots of things, right? But here's here's what I can say. If you can do it with a permission set, I would make the operating assumption that you will not be able to do it with a profile once spring 26 happens. Right now, what we already have a button on our profiles that if you click, it will take all of the permissions out of that profile and stick them in a permission set with the same name. So since that exists, I would assume there's no real barrier to prevent them from going ahead with this. Like, I don't believe it's going to be what Salesforce calls a crook or critical release update. It's just going to happen. They're going to flip a switch. A job is going to run. Hopefully, it won't be like Pardot Gate in 2019. Ah. Uh, you know, uh, I, like I think the biggest problem is going to be those of us who have like a GitHub repo that stores our source of truth, right? If you wait until the last moment, your your profiles, if you include them in your repo, that will make your CI break or your delivery. It'll fail because that won't be permi permitted anymore, right? But other than that, I don't think there's really a reason for them to not let this happen. I think they're just gonna steamroll it. It'll be the exact opposite of classic, which like the migration off of classic, we still have classic users today, right? Even though they've certainly stopped, right? They can flip you over to lightning as many times as they want. I don't think they can actually forcibly take classic away. There are still too many little things that will cause a problem, right? So I think for this, it's just gonna happen. <laughs> Yeah, if, if we have it taken care of, we should be able to stop them because there's a way, right? You can prevent them from auto-creating one. If you remove all of the permissions from the profile, there won't be anything for the job to do, right? So that's that's one way to, to get that to happen. Um, let's jump on to the next slide, please. We have a question, Kathy? Yeah, on the top right, it says use the minimum access profile. And why is that instead of like standard user? Yeah, you know, this is this is uh, Cheryl's slide. I actually would not recommend using the minimum access profile. Um, I would leave your existing profile in place. Yep. Everything that you use today that is defaulted to that profile, you want to keep all of that, right? That's this is valuable stuff. What you want to do is remove the permissions. So the existing profiles you have today, you could just continue to use those tomorrow. So. Uh, She's suggesting it because that's a profile that they wrote onto everybody. Uh, they wrote it into your org. And generally speaking, it's it's similar to the sales user. I actually think there's a lot of access on that profile. It's not very minimum. Um, and if you are in an org that existed before they pushed that profile, uh, there's a null value on all the page layout assignments. So you have to fix that before you can use it. Cool. Jesse? Is there any read on like what the transition might look like? Like at some point, are we going to stop being able to create profiles that have permissions in advance of this cutover? Are we going to stop making uh, problems before we make it better? I don't think they're going to do anything like that. That would be rather un salesforce of them. Uh, salesforce tends to, and I say this as my, like I've worked at Salesforce for about three years. Take this with a grain of salt. I don't work there anymore. Uh, Salesforce has a tendency to minimize the duration of an impact. So what their desired goal is, one of their goals on the inside is to make sure that an incident takes the smallest amount of time off of individual people. That's what leads you to have a release weekend, like a series of release weekends, so that they can run jobs on a limited set 
and and not have to be like okay well yours you're at noon to noon 15 they're at you know 12 15 to 12 30 like no 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 we're just we're gonna have one narrow set we're gonna smash through all of it and then be done right and so i don't see them making any changes gradually they're gonna just flip a switch and say it's done or they're gonna do it for you really okay skip forward two slides for me if you could okay so uh just quickly reviewing level setting one of our tools we have the profile you get one per user that's your base level of access right you've got permission sets you can have as many of these as you want i don't know if there's an actual limit uh there are some pragmatic limits but nothing real i think and these are additive in nature that's the most important thing and then you've got permission set groups just a way to to say these permission sets i'm going to assign them all to you at once right that's not technically how it works but that's the effect that you have um permission set groups are really cool and if you're not using them today you probably should be uh, my favorite feature on the permission set group is that you can have them expire right so oftentimes what i find i get a user they come up to me uh and they're like hey i'm going to be backing up that person while they're out on maternity leave uh and so i need all the access that they have great i'm just going to give you their permissions that group and have it expire two days after that person is supposed to come back from leave right really really great feature uh, easy to use and then you don't have to have a calendar invite reminding you to remove that access right i don't i don't want that because then i'm going to be on pto i'm not going to go back and look and that person's going to have too much access forever um and then here i have this awesome feature called muting permissions and i have it highlighted um i saw in that that really cool survey 17 percent of you use muting permissions and so i'm assuming 17 percent of you can answer this question for me but if i have a permission set group and it has permissions that are muted, and then I assign all the permission sets in that group to the user, does the user have the access that was muted or not? What do we think? Somebody toss a guess out. I'm gonna say yes. I'm gonna say no. I'm gonna say no. Yeah, they definitely have the access. 100% they have the access. But this is the beautiful thing about permission set groups. I really love them. They're fantastic. This is a, this is a, a not well explained feature. If I give you a permission set group and I mute some permissions, that, that muting, it happened within the scope of the permission set group. So if I then okay. give you a, right? Because it's additive in nature. So if I give you a permission set group and some permission sets, you have the total sum of both, right? So it's a risky feature. It's not to say that you shouldn't use it, but it's something you got to be aware of, or if you're not, you're going to find yourself in a situation where you've accidentally over-provisioned a person, assuming that you muted something when you really didn't, right? I do think it's sort of dangerous. That's why I put it in red. It, it terrifies me. I have not used it with a single customer ever in my life. Okay. I think you can go two slides actually. Oh, nope, just one. This slide's very important. Okay, so uh, I always say this, what's our goal? Why are we doing this? Well, our goal is to be well-architected. Goal is always to be well-architected, not just because this is an architect user group. Uh, it's just because everything we do should be well-architected. Why not, right? Overthink it all. Just go ahead and do it, right? So there's all sorts of reasons why these rules would apply the one that I want you to focus on the most is secure within this trusted thing. I want it to be secure, right? I want it to be secure. That's why I worry about muting permissions. And I specifically, I'm going to approach this problem using this principle of least privilege, right? The principle of least privilege, if you're not familiar with it, it's just this basic idea that if somebody doesn't need something, you shouldn't really give it to them. There's a there's a an amount of that where you you sort of balance right. I'm not going to be like, look, you only you only use four fields, so I'm going to go out of my way to create something that that just shows you the four fields, and then I'm going to engineer access for you that only gives you that object, those four fields only read, right? That's kind of extreme, but I am going to design my approach with the principle of least privilege in mind, and so certainly when I get to data, I'm going to be very accurate. But when I think about fields and objects and apps, I'm, I'm definitely gonna go, look, 
these ones are pretty benign, right? They're not sensitive at all. So I'll let those be shared rather easily, but I'm going to make it more difficult to share things that are uh, more sensitive, right? Because I'm thinking about that principle of least privilege. So now we can jump ahead two slides. Okay, so let's see this thing. Let's see the model, okay? Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna make three permission sets. We're gonna take those three permission sets and we are gonna put them in a permission set group and we're gonna name it after a persona. We're gonna have a lot of permission set groups, right? I'm gonna have a lot of permission sets, but because it's in a model, we're going to be able to do this in a way where I can predict what permissions a person got and where they came from. And it's going to be very easy for me to maintain and we'll see that. It's also going to give me a high amount of reusability, right? Reusability is one aspect of scale. I really, really, really love it when I can reuse something effectively and safely. And we can do that as long as there's a model that kind of suggests how this thing works, right? So uh, let's jump into the, the next slide and we'll see exactly how we make this happen. So here's how we start. We start with a profile, right? You have to have one, right? This isn't going away. We're keeping it. And so now that profile is our base building block and we use it for the default. Okay, next slide. We're gonna build our first permission set. I call this the base permission set. And the base permission set is going to contain uh, essentially system permissions. Like, can I use flow? Can I see a public list view, right? That's all that you put in here. There's no actual access being granted. There's functional things that the user can do. And most of these, if you think about your company, most of the people at your company could do the same things. And so in most of the companies I've worked with setting up this model, I've made one of these, right? And I get to reuse it across every permission set group I have. Occasionally, you might have a couple, right? But at a minimum, this is going to be a department-wide thing. If you have sales, service, and marketing, you probably have a minimum of a whole one for sales, but you might, like I said, you probably just have one for the whole company. Um, next slide, please. So this is, this is my favorite one. This is the read level permission set. This is gonna be all of the apps, tabs, objects, and fields at a read level only. You cannot create, you cannot delete, you cannot edit, right? Also, we're going to think about principle of least privilege. No PCI, PII, PHI, none of that. If it's encrypted, absolutely not. If it's sensitive in any type of way, absolutely not. And we're not talking about one object here. I'm talking about a collection of objects. So if this is, if I'm, if I'm working on uh, sales users in general, this is probably my lead, account, contact, opportunity, opportunity line item, product, any other objects I'm using, right? It's probably got tasks. It's probably got all sorts of different objects in it that help create everything that goes into the UI for the sales organization. And this is gonna be a big one, right? But remember, I've defined it as safe and reusable. So I know there's nothing risky in here. So if someone comes out of the woodwork and says that they need to be able to see everything that these salespeople can see, cool. We just add this to whatever they use. And I know I'm good. So it's a very nice, stable building block that I'm going to use over and over and over again. Okay, next slide. So now we're going to come up with a juicy one. This is the one with all the risk. Not going to reuse this very often at all if I reuse it. This is a persona one. This is essentially just for your job. So now I'm not talking about sales in general. I'm talking about inside sales or outside sales or sales manager, right? These are specific functions. Now here, all sorts of permissions are gonna live. Can you edit it, delete it? Are you allowed to create it? Um, are, are there some extra things that you can do that nobody else can do, right? You have access to apps that no one else can use. Um, maybe there's controllers that are referenced. There's custom permissions, right? Anything like that probably lives up here. I know I'm not going to reuse this. And so I've, I know I've built it in a really targeted way, right? And it's going to let you do your job when I give you the other two, right? Anything that is covered by the read or the base, I don't need to give you here again because you already have that. Um, next slide, please. 
to make this easy, we're going to wrap all of these in a single permission set group. And I'm going to name that permission set group after the persona that I made the persona permission set for. So again, inside sales, PSG, right? Outside sales, PSG. Um, now, from a user management perspective, this becomes super simple. I dealt with you as a user by giving you the profile and the permission set group, effectively giving you everything you need, right? Yeah, you still need a role, you still need some other things, but I can do all of the permissioning with this tool. So it works really well. It's gonna scale for me. I'm not gonna run into any issues. Um, this is a good place to stop. Does anyone have any questions about the model? Cause this is it. Awesome. Well, let's dive through an example and then I'll open it up for questions again. So if you could go to the next slide for me. Uh, what we're gonna look at is let's say you're in an org or you're a consultant, you've shown up in an org and this model's in place. Elevated purposes. Oh, we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, so if you, if you were stepping into an org and they said, hey, we've got this new thing that we built and I want you to go out and add to it. Okay, it's gonna be fine, right? I've got five different groups of people. They all need different access. Let's see how the model works. Go to the next slide, please. So what I've got here is these are supposed to, these boxes represent our permission set groups, okay? Now I know that everybody's starting on a profile. It's this minimum access is the one I used in the example. And so I know that from the profile perspective, I'm not gonna do anything, right? I know I don't put anything in the profile anyway, so there's nothing to change here. Go to the next slide for me. So here I have a base, right? All of my users in the example, they were all sales users, right? Except for the executives, they have a special base because I don't let my executives do as much as everybody else, right? They cannot be trusted, right? I never let an executive manage a public list view. They will delete the list views used in your community. Don't do this. They will ruin everything, okay? So I have this big base. It's used by my entire sales organization. And I know I had a new app, well, a new app has nothing to do with functionality, right? It's not like the, didn't, the app isn't coming with the ability to run reports, right? And so I'm actually going to make no changes to this permission set, right? Next slide, please. Now I look in here, I see that all of my users that I care about have this read sales apps. And this is a new app for sales. So I'm going to take the app itself, the tabs, the object, if there were any, and the fields, if there are any, at the read level, and I'm going to stick them in here. And by editing this one permission set, I now know that the entire organization has the right access to read my build. I edited one permission set, and I'm already done, right? So if nobody else had any editing or deleting, my work with them is already complete. Next slide, please. So here... I can see that I was able to reuse my sales team, right? Because the yep. people love them in the management line, they all had that access. And so here I'm gonna go through and give the specifics of, can you create, do whatever, right? In practice, I found this part, reusing, like giving the people above the base, that actually makes it easier to manage in the long run because I always want my sales managers to have what the sales team themselves have, right? So I'm only going to update the creating because let's say everybody can create. I only need to update the sales team with create. Everybody else, I could just worry about deleting, editing, that type of thing, right? So I'd go through, update these permission sets per the requirements. And again, I know whatever I add at this tier is safe because I'm only giving the ability to delete, for example, to those SVPs, right? And then if you go to the next slide, I put this in here just because I want to be fair. Technically, it's a yeah. thing I could do, right? But if you were following along with this as a concept, I would never, ever, ever need mute because I would have never given anybody something that they didn't need. But if you need it. If you need it, it's there. Yeah. And there, exactly. there are use cases. Yeah, there are use cases. I just don't use them. Okay, so there were, um, this is it, by the way. So this is the one, if you wanna take a screenshot of something, this is the slide you want. Um, and there were a handful of questions in here. How do you handle elevated permissions in your model? 
So if I understand you correctly, you're saying I need to elevate your permissions for like the flight of a transaction? At least I'm assuming that's what you mean? Uh, Mike, this is Boyan. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah. So just to clarify my question, right? So when I talk about elevated permissions, I'm talking about system admin. So let's say system oh, admin, yeah. like modify all delete. I have to give some people interim, you know, consultants, modify all delete. What's yeah. the strategy there? Yeah. So that's a really good question. So uh, there's a couple of different states that my admins um, that I have managed have, have had. So I have admins that are pre-production, essentially engineers. And in a SOX compliant world, their access in production is significantly reduced, almost none. What I can do for those admins to simplify my life is create a permission set group called non-production admin. And I can put every single read permission set in it and I can, I can walk away. Because what I've done is I've given them the ability to, to, they can see every UI they need. They can see the, the fundamental pieces of fields and whatnot, the structures that we deemed as safe, but I didn't give them a base. They actually have zero functionality. They can't do anything, right? But they can see everything that they need to be able to see in production. So it's a really simple way for me to achieve the desired result. Um, when I need to, to change them, like you're doing a release, it's that release window or it's the maintenance window and I need to ramp things up. I have another permission set group that is, you know, production administrator. And then I can use that expiration date so I can assign that production admin to you. And then I know it's going to expire in three days time at the conclusion of the weekend, um, what have you, right? So that's how I manage it. Um, I put all those scary permissions in that permission set group. Does that help? Okay, I had another question. Uh, naming conventions for the permission sets. That is, uh, that is a really good question. And then you also asked uh, how to document what's in it without having to poke through areas or looking with an IDE. Uh, so for that, Salesforce has made a big improvement. Uh, there's a new feature that I'm totally blanking on, but Stuart's gonna look it up for me. Uh, it's essentially an install package that you can do. It's from Salesforce Labs. Um, I want to say it's permissions analyzer, but I may have that wrong. Um, but that that permissions tool will let you kind of explore the access that's there. If you've ever tried to report uh, what a user has access to today, it is challenging. And, and this does help clean that up. Um, I am a huge advocate, though, of having VS Code on your machine and using the Salesforce tools and just extract that file and look at it. It is the fastest way to see what something is. Um, did you already find it, Stu? Yeah, well, so yeah, I, I have a permission, yeah, permission set uh, uh, analyzer. I'll, I'll, I can find the exact name. I, I can, I can find the link for you. I've got it in my notes here, but uh, there are some, um, there are some uh, disclaimers about that tool. If you are in an enterprise uh, org that has over 5,000 users, um, you cannot use that tool to create reports. You can still um, look at a specific user or a specific permission set to see what's in that permission set and yeah. what uh, uh, certain entitlements a user has. But if you try and cr create a report on profiles, permission sets, permission sets groups, it will bomb and kick you out uh, because it uh, does not run reports over 5,000 users. Um, this is very true. So uh, using VS Code to analyze all of your metadata or dump it out into a, uh, a JSON file is probably a good bet. True story. Uh, and then you'd also ask Nikki about uh, naming conventions. I think naming convention is really critical. Um, and I don't want to be overly prescriptive. I'll tell you, I have a naming convention and it has not kept the same between the first company and any company that followed. Uh, as long as it makes sense to you, it's the right one, right? 
Um, I would stick with the word somewhere in there, base, read, and you don't have to put persona, but understanding a base as a base helps, I think. And the same with read, understanding, hey, this is read for, you know, my total quality management group. This is read for whatever. Um, as long as you know what to maintain, because the real goal, one of the goals, right, of this model is if I hire you as a consultant and I want you to come in, I can tell you in my user story the exact name of the permission sets that you need to look for. Or I could give you the name of the permission set group and tell you to update the appropriate permission set within it. So it becomes really simple for me because in my user stories, I'm always going to define my user. So I already have what I need right there in the user story. So as long as you get that persona part right in the permission set group, whatever name makes sense to you and your company, I would say that's probably a good one. Uh, let's see. Oh, do I have a paper explaining this model? Um, I don't, but I do have a presentation uh, that I'm giving at a user group in Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll post the presentation so that way you guys can get it later as well as the video. Um, my how long job. have you been using this model? How am I what? What, what, what? How long have you been using this approach? I have been using this approach for a little over a year, actually. Uh, no regrets up to this point. How do you suggest? addressing when Salesforce either adds new permissions that they just automatically enable? Yes, yes, or yes. Or it's a split. Um, I honestly think the split is harder. So uh, use like manage users is a good example of this. Um, manage users, I don't think it's happened yet, but it is on the roadmap to have managed users be split into, I believe, five different things. And when that split happens, you just have to audit, right? Who did have managed users and what, what of these now five things am I gonna need to remove, right? Um, because there's so many folks that like, they got managed users because I wanted them to be able to manage a queue, right? Or, or something else. And that's gonna be an independent permission. So I, I think the split is a little bit of a challenge. Uh, Honestly, the best way to deal with splits, you've got to read the release notes, realize that it's going to happen, and then before it changes, run your report, know what you need to audit, and then go. If you use source control, you can look in your source control and see it. And also, when you go to push that, unless they come, if they left a permission of the same name, which would be rude, uh, your deploy would fail, right? Which is a good way of catching that, hey, I missed something in the notes, right? Um, and then for, for what was the other part of your question? It wasn't splits. It was, oh, when they create new permissions. Um, when they create new permissions, honestly, I think the most of the time when they create a new permission or they change the name of a permission, it just blow ups my CI CD process. And I just have to go through and do some type of uh, change. Like when I update the metadata version, the, the package JSON version, um, but if, if you know that it's a problem, the easiest way to visualize it for me has always been to just create a list view on the permission sets and, and just show this, this column is the new one that was created. But again, you're not going to know that that permission exists unless you caught it in the release notes, which, you know, since they average about 500 pages, it's pretty easy to miss. Uh, so I don't know that there's any real secret sauce on that one. Did you see the question about what do you do for app exchange packages when they add their own set of permission sets? Um, so that's a great question. When you have a permission set that must be assigned, and there's a handful of instances where that will be true even outside of this, um, I would use, like, you've got to have some type of documentation that says, hey, when we set up new users in this circumstance, we have to do this. Um, there's, there's an example, for example, if you're using communities, you can add a 
permission set to a community as an audience member, but you can't add a permission set group. But that breaks the model, right? So what I end up doing in that is I have a separate permission set and you have to get the group and the permission set. And it, it has to remain a two-part thing because Salesforce still has some debt, right? They have to address that. They rolled out a permission set group feature, but they still force you to use a permission set. Well, that's just them and a roadmap, right? Eventually that problem will get fixed and then we'll, we'll clean it up. Um, and I would just treat one of those like that, right? Um, and even some of your licenses will do something like that. I think field service has a couple that you have to have the permission set, right? You don't have the flexibility. Um, the management of that's gonna get a little bit easier. Uh, user access policies will be a good way to help kind of manage all of that. If you haven't played with that tool, I don't know when that goes GA. Uh, I know it was not a beta fairly recently. Yeah, it's open beta now. That was my next question. Have you used it? Are you using it in a production environment? Um, I never used it in a production environment. I used it in a full copy environment. I, I tried to abuse it and I did not ever have an issue. Um, user access policies is a pretty cool tool that allows you to specify the configuration of a user and then specify the changes to that user that you would like. So I could say all sales managers, I want you to remove everything that you have and give them this profile, this permission set group, period. Um, very, very potent tool. It runs that as a bulkified transaction. And I think it was pretty stable. I didn't, I didn't break it. Uh, and I tried, I, I really did. I tried. Um, Stuart. Yeah. Yeah. And all in all transparency, um, Mike has, has given me this talk, uh, one by one. So I've actually been trying to put this uh into practice in our org and we have a financial um I, wor I work at a financial services organization that has um uh over 5,000 active users as i said we have actually 16,000 users in our org and um many profiles and many more uh permission sets so i've been looking at this model and also have been looking at uh louise Lockie's uh, model which um may or may not be all that different, but she takes a little bit different stance of looking at like uh, the different jobs to be done. So what are all the things around reporting that might go into a different set of permissions and um, different things around um, uh, user control or user access and put those into a different uh, permission set and then, and then assign them to the different personas like we have listed here. Um, but I, I had the same question around the the different app exchange packages. So when we roll out uh, financial services cloud FSC, that's a that's an entire managed package that comes with with its own set of uh, data, new data model, new permission sets, new new everything. And it it's not that it necessarily breaks this uh, philosophy, but it it adds this whole new dimension of um, how do we manage this? Do we manage this from our own platform team or do we have to have a committee in which we look at every single thing and say, well, does that go into the, the base permission sets or does that go into the uh, uh, special um, persona permission sets or do right. we create a whole new set of permission right. sets for FSC? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And I think, and this is something I said, I've, I've told lots of people, and I will happily admit to everybody here, this is a model. It's a really great place to start. If you need to shift it to achieve your objectives, do so, right? Uh, if you're in a small nonprofit org, Louise's model actually works really well because it gives you these, this small set of functional buckets, and you may have more job titles than you have functions. So go with the one that makes sense for you. An organization like Stewart's it's got 17,000 users, don't do functional buckets. There's 8,000 functional buckets. That's too many, yeah. right? Um, in, in the last nasty org I was in, there were 348 jobs. That's a lot of jobs. 
but that's 348 groups directly tied to a, a job. So when you came in and they created you in Workday and your job title made it to Active Directory and Active Directory pushed that user provisioning, it was really easy. You know, I actually went to SailPoint then, but SailPoint went in, it made it easy, right? Because there's this harmonization between the, the permission set group that you needed and your job title, which was something I was pulling in anyway, right? So it, it, when you think about it from that perspective, life did get better, right? Because one of the hardest things for us to do, we brought in SailPoint, which was the new user provisioning access tool. And they just said, who needs what access? And I remember looking at the company and the, you know, the, I was like, yeah, can you write that access down for me? And we were in this guilty habit of people would open a ticket and say, hey, I can't see something that person has mirror their access with me. And what helped us would do is they go, okay, you have A, B, D, they have A, B, C. And so they go to you and they just added C because that's what you were missing. And so now you have A, B, C, D. You didn't get mirrored at all. You got, you got at it. And so I had one team, and this is granted an egregious example, um, across the entire team, there were three users that had the same setup and every other user was unique to themselves. So, you know, like user management is just difficult. This allows you to configure the building blocks of user management in a relatively stable and effective way. It doesn't fix user management. User management is still difficult because they're users. They don't want to be managed. I don't know if you've ever met them, but they are <laughs> challenging group. Do you have any questions in the room? Steve? Um, is there, with that model, is there any different approaches you apply with the API only permission set profile? Or do you do anything different with that? Or is it, do you, do you take a similar approach? Yeah, so um, for my, there's a similar question in chat as well. Uh, how would you architect this for an integrated user? Um, in the, you can give them the read and even though it contains apps and tabs, uh, you can also give them that API only user and that'll force it back down to be that the, the API only access that you want, but you would put that in their persona level, right? Along with whatever other access you have. Now, truth be told in my model, I did have a persona that was essentially the ability to edit everything, um, but that persona was in an integration. It was used for an integration to our ERP that, that could edit everything, right? So, and even within that, there were some limits, right? Um, and so you can still get away with that. You can still do that, but you know that that permission set is actually never gonna be assigned to a user. That permission set's only gonna go in the one permission set group. And that permission set group is only assigned to the integration user that it was built for, right? Cool, thank you. Yeah. Uh, let's see what else is here. In winter 24, there's a beta view summary button on a perm set, so Salesforce is starting to help. That's, that's a nice feature I didn't know about. Managed package vendors. Managed package vendors, that's a really great question. Um, so if you are, like you're a partner, you created a tool that you're selling out in the Salesforce or ecosystem and you are on the back end of a managed package, I would recommend adopting a permission set group and permission sets unless you already have a model that allows you to assign one permission set and achieve a complete result. Um, I will say one of the things that Salesforce does not complain about enough in security reviews is that there's no nuance. Um, the way that I approach this, I can very easily create a view all user. And in a lot of 
you know, packages, you, there's always some amount of editing, right? So there's no, there's no like, let me just have you come in and window shop. That, that feature doesn't exist. And I, I do that as a, as a requirement, right? So if I'm building a, uh, like an LWC that achieves some result, uh, you being able to see that LWC means there's a custom permission with read for that LWC. If you can edit, then there's a custom permission for the edit level. And if you're allowed to actually delete something or create something, there are permissions for that as well. And I do those as standalone custom permissions. So I would recommend that you adopt actually using custom permissions to regulate things. And if you do, then this model works well. If you just give people access to things because they have the permission set, then it, you don't really need it. I'm trying to keep up with the chat, but it keeps scrolling on me. Uh, what's the best practice to go from our current profiles to this model? That is the million dollar question. My cheap answer is you just call me. I work at CapTech. I'll fix that for you. Um, the real answer is don't try to fix the profile at the same time. You have to, I mean, come on, it's, it's, a, it's a cheap shot. Um, so don't try to fix the profile at the same time. Um, it's very easy to say, oh, well, when I do this, I only need like two profiles. I got it's like sysadmin and everybody else. But remember all those defaults I kind of harped on at the beginning, all that stuff still matters. <laughs> you know, so what I would do is I would pick a profile and I would take the entire contents of that profile and dump it into the model, right? Um, assign, you're gonna end up with lots of permission set groups by just doing the profile. After that, take one of those personas and then pick the user and make the business identify one user that's set up right. Because I guarantee you they're not all the same, right? So you get the one user and then you migrate their permission sets into the model and then you make them your guinea pig. Assign them the permission set group. Don't change anything else. And they should still be able to do everything. They shouldn't have gained any access, right? And then after that, you should be able to remove all their permission sets. And again, nothing should change. And then after that, you can move on to the next persona, right? Adding your users as you go. When you are done and you have taken every persona that is touching that, per that profile and they're all on the one or the one permission set group, no other permission sets, then you could go to that profile and actually start peeling the permissions back from the profile. And what you're gonna be left with is the shell of the profile with all of its defaults. And that should be pretty stable. It should work well for you. Um, that is a, that's not a fast process, but it's very safe, right? Um, and since we have time, that's the way that I've been implementing this, right? I, I, haven't, I haven't tried to rush people. I've just tried to teach them, right? If you, can, if you can get through it, you will eventually get it done and you can use it as kind of like your filler like in our sprints, if I had somebody, you know, I didn't have like a one story point thing available. Well, I do, trust me. I'll just grab one of these permission pieces and give it to you off the shelf. Because a lot of times having this work done is difficult because the business isn't gonna get a lot of ROI out of it, right? We just need to do it. There is ROI. We can, we can paint the picture of saying, look, user management is easier, but you know, the business oftentimes doesn't buy into that. Uh, okay, are these slides going to be shared? Yes, I have already sent them along. Uh, and I think we're going to make them available. Yep, we'll uh, post them. Hey, Mike, really quick, going back to the yeah. timeline. Is this yes. in the live? Is spring 26, right? Uh, spring 26, yes. So you can think, oh, I have 14, 15 months to get this done. Why should I care now? Yeah. What do you think? Um, I know best practice. What do you think would be like if you're six months out? Are you uh, going to be rushing and tripping on yourself? Like, what would yes. what would be a comfortable timeline? One hundred percent. I think if so, I think you need you need one day per role at a minimum. If you think about that and you are now scared, then you should start immediately. <laughs> here's, here's here's the thing right let's take it take it simplistically let's say that today on day one i build the whole thing soup to nuts right i'm a wizard and i can do that i'll build the whole thing soup to nuts and i get it to you by lunchtime to test 
when am I going to hear back from you next week? If I, if I just get through one of these a day, how long is it going to take you? Mike, I have another question for you and, and for the group, um, because this came up this morning in a meeting. You, you don't have a day every week until um, spring 26 or whatever it is, yeah. Be because you have a job. And, and I, I assume that everyone in the room probably is uh, a scrum, sprint, agile team, and you are um, measured, your, your met metrics are by your, your rundown. And so yeah. any product owner or any scrum master in the room is going to say, well, wait, 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 wait. You want me to spend all my time on this technical debt because uh, somebody at Salesforce said that you need to move all your profiles to permission sets? No, no, no. I've got business problems to solve. I've got uh, product owners and product managers on my butt to yeah. answer business problems. You, what are you telling me to do here? How do you make the business case to say that this whole thing that you showed me is actually important? Why am I doing this, Mike? Yeah, and so so this is the great the great thing about being in the role that I'm in. Uh, I, that's that's I let me let me get you with an account executive that I'll explain that. <laughs> um, the 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 simple problem is if you look across your org, you probably have several symptoms, right? Uh, you will have a team that is not configured uniformly, which means you already don't have your access controls. Uh, within your control, right? Uh, you're going to see that you have um, poor documentation around how users should be configured. So if I create a new sales director, what access should they have? You probably won't be able to answer that question for every role that you have. Uh, you will probably have outdated reference material that is outdated as soon as you print it that your help desk is using to create things or that your auto provisioning tools are using to create users. And they're simply out of date because uh, who goes back and updates that thing? You know, We just manually correct it for that one person every randomly when they get hired and then five years from now you're doing it for every user. It's like you don't even have auto provisioning anymore, right? These are the symptoms of models that are fundamentally incompatible with the task that they were set to do. And that's because most of you in the room, and I'm not trying to be mean when I say this, but you don't have a model. You just sort of build them because no one ever told you that these were gonna become a thing, right? Like raise your hand if when you started and the ideal was I created a profile and it's perfect, right? I created a profile, it gives you everything you need, done, right? Like that was my, that was my dream build when I started on Salesforce. It was classic, it was a Tuesday. Right, um, that paradigm is just gone. And whether we want to deal with this or not, it is something that we're going to have to deal with. And in my org, when I started this, I had 1178 permission sets. Again, I only had 300, 340, whatever uh, jobs. I had 1100 <coughs> permission sets. Right? That's a challenge. That's a challenge. How am I, I mean, my my documentation, I think, to, to help desk included 70 of those permission sets. And it was comical, right? Um, dealing with it is the only way to, to get out of the pickle, right? Uh, building the ROI for it, I don't know, what's your maintenance cost you? And what would it cost you to fail a SOX compliance audit, right? If you're, if you're in an industry where that matters, you know, like how, how nice would it be if we could just say, here's our access model and there's, here's the, here's each of the things. This is how it works. Like, isn't that nice? Like your auditor is going to love you. All right. I, I always use security as in my excuse to do things like this. Cause we get, we get, you know, scans and audits and, and things like that. And, yeah. So, and, you know, not in all honesty, it's, it's partly true, right? Because if you don't address it, you know, there's, you know, the SaaS compliance yeah. and other things you need to worry about. Um, but also, you know, in terms of timing, it, you know, Salesforce is the hyper force, you know, path that you're taking. Most things are going to be instant changes, right? Like like the, you know, weekend outages, you know, for, for, 
for updates. That's going to be a thing of the past, you know, to the point where they're talking about less than a second or or, or, or a minute for changes to go through. So um, not to scare anybody, uh, but I think you, you need to think of that as being the norm as we move forward. And, and so you have to like prioritize that into your discussions with, you, with your product managers and your business owners you know, stakeholders and everything like that as, hey, we've, we've you know, notoriously neglected these, these, these items or these areas of the system, and it's caused more issues than you may realize that need to be addressed um, so that, you know, it's not just this, this pound, this, this, this amount of technical debt that just keeps getting larger and larger, where, you know, you always say, hey, we're going to get to it one day. Um, yeah, it's going to be another amount of that. We keep that approach. Yeah, and... You know, I mean, if if you are in an org where you can point to security, this is, that's that is a really easy way to make the case to do this. How I'm going to do it in my org is we have a certain amount of points every sprint allocated to tech debt. So you plan out. Yeah. You, know, you plan out. Say so this is what we're going to do in the next next few sprints. Yeah. So that's, if you can work that in, because we have to fight. With the product team to get, you know, five, four, three or four points for tech debt every sprint. So if you can work to get that, that hopefully you can package that there. I, I mean, that's that's a good way to start, right? Because then you'll know, like, when you're six months out, you'll know if you're in a good place or not, right? Do you need to begin prioritizing it more? But at least by then, you'll have some people with some familiarity. You'll be relying on the model. Uh, you know, it's it's going to start to become something where you're like, oh, hey, the user management is way better when we're working with this this division that's already fixed. This one over here, it's just a cluster, right? Um, I mean, I think the thing that's interesting is like I've already had conversations internally about when we're going to not accept this as work, uh, and it's before the spring of twenty six, uh, because I think when we get down to it. it, it we're gonna run out of time to actually implement it and test it. And it's gonna be something that we're on the backside of that. It's gonna be 2026 in May. And you know, orgs are gonna look around and they're gonna go, oh, okay, well, we have we have 8,000 permission sets that we have no idea what to do. Right. Like how how do you fix it then? So at least now we have we have time and we have a plan, right? Okay. Yeah, I have two questions. So one, yeah. did I understand correctly earlier, you're saying if orgs do nothing, when the switchover happens, the profiles will be kind of cloned as permission sets, so that the permissions move out of the profiles for permission set. And then essentially, user, yes, that profile get assigned to that permission set automatically. I am assuming that that's what the script will do. Mm -hmm. But I mean, Salesforce will run a job, and it it'll be par.gate only they'll mean it, right? But yeah. I mean, if you think about it, they're going to be removing the permissions from your system admins. If something goes wrong, like I would want that access to already be in a permission set or sets, and I would want that access to be assigned to those users. Well, that was my second question. Do we think there's gonna be any out of the box system admin permission set? Uh, that's but a really good question. I don't. How would you even configure anything in a new org? Yeah, I, I would think that the system admin is going to become, um, you know, like there, there are a handful of permission sets that are actually managed, just like the profiles are actually managed. And I believe that the system admin one, just pragmatically speaking, it's got to be managed, right? They've got to be able to push things to it um, and maintain it. So I believe we will see that. Um, but I don't think that it's particularly disruptive to the model because what you're gonna have is a permission set group called system admin. And when that magic system admin permission set actually is created, you'll just add it to the group with whatever you already had there. Salesforce will continue to maintain that one and maybe not necessarily yours, but yours will be model compliant and you'll be able to address it with your SOX auditors or like, cause that was one of the things that came up with me. Uh, being able to justify every decision that I made and exactly the build and the model with my SOX auditor team, right? Uh, you'll be able to justify that saying that one's managed by Salesforce. I have no idea what's in it. You can go look, but it's probably duplicative to the other stuff we have. 
Any other questions? Uh, what about the permissions and licenses? Do you uh, manage those separately in your model or? I do. Um, the permissions that license has to be administered separately, as far as I'm aware. I think you can, in certain instances, you can grant permissions with permission sets that will cause the license to be assigned. Um, but the license is still going to be assigned separately. Like field service has some of those that sticks out top of mind. Um, or if I give you access to the Gantt, you're going to get a dispatcher license in the process. Um, so things like that can happen, but I don't, I don't think they're going to merge that technology or those tools. I don't think they're going to merge them anytime soon. Okay. And then on that note, uh, my only experience is field service as well. So um, when you start up like the admin component of field service, it's checking for your permissions. Um, I'm not sure if it's checking to see if you've been assigned the permissions that it created or it's just looking for the individual permissions in whatever permission set that you created. Yeah. Um, so I, I know a product engineer that I can ask his question to verify. Uh, if, you, if you follow up with me, I might be misspeaking, but I'm pretty confident. Um, when you go in, it's actually checking your permission set license assignment. So there's a there's separate object permission set license assignment, and that's what's actually giving that user the ability to use field service at all, right? And so if you're the uh, if you have the right permission set licenses assigned, and then you have the right permissions, you're good to go. So you can build all of FSL into this model, uh, and you would do it for all of your personas. So I have a permission set group for dispatcher, permission set group for internal tech permission set group for external tech, right? Which is actually doing some community stuff. And it has a community single standalone permission set uh, that is just, you know, uh, contractor community login, basically. Um, and you would take all of those, wrap them in your group the same way that you normally would, and then assign those to your users. That will work out well. Um, and when you do that assignment, the permission set license assignment record will be created because you've given them access to something that requires it. Okay, and will that also allow you to work with the changes that the managed package made? So it does. Um, most notably, when they changed, what well, was the last one that was really irritating? They changed, uh, like, they changed the name of what it means to be a field service user. Like that, that checkbox changed the name of it. Um, and that, that like broke everything immediately. But, you know, once you fix your source, everything continues to work just fine. And you can add the managed package permission sets into your group. So that, that's not actually an issue. Yeah, and that's what I was asking. Did you replicate it or just integrate them into your model? I, I don't integrate them into my model because they can push access I don't want to give. Okay. But that's just me. All right, Austin, any other questions? Awesome. Well, hey, uh, thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Um, I will say if you have any questions, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, it's very easily. I'm Mike Reynolds, uh, SFTC Mike. So in slash SFTC Mike, that'll find me. Or you can find me on Twitter, same thing, SFTC underscore Mike. Um, and if you have any questions, please reach out. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, even though I work for consultancy, I'll help you out. So uh, thank you all very much. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat>